Good evening, ladies. Good evening, Ms. Rowe. I'm so happy to be here. I really love coming to your band of home. You don't know how much you just make my life, make my day, just to come and fellowship with you and the things that you share. I appreciate each and every one of you. Tonight, I'm going to share with you, as we're all women, how God uses you know, we're, we're all imperfect. We all have imperfections. But sometimes we look at the Bible and all we see is the disciples. We see John the Baptist. And we see the men. The men are very highlighted. And sometimes as women, we think God forgot us or he doesn't use us or that we're not significant. But I just came by today to share a couple stories with you and even share a nugget or two of some things I learned while I was studying about uh, some of the women in the Bible. Um, and I'll give you scripture. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to like read all the scriptures because I don't want to overwhelm you, but I want to give it to you so that you can read them later if you would like, okay? So I will be talking to you about Rahab, and that can be found in Joshua 2, 1. I will read Rahab. Joshua what? Joshua 2. Verse 1. Yes, in the Old Testament. Joshua 2, verse 1. Joshua 2, verse 1. Does everyone have it? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I'm imperfect, so I, I forget <laughs> where the books are sometimes, too. But, amen. Joshua 2, 1 says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent his message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the boards of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out the gate, as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. <coughs> <clears throat> so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, and you came out of Egypt, and what you did in Shehom and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign 
that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives. The man assured her, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. And she led them down and by the road through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she has said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself there three days until they return and then go your way. I just wanted to talk to you about some of the women in the Bible. <coughs> and in particular, I'll put my emphasis quickly on Rahab and the other person I'm going to put the emphasis on is Sarah. So um, I'm just going to give you some of the women in the Bible. And if you want to write down the scriptures, you're welcome to. The Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, that's found in John 4. And I'm just giving you some women if you'd like to look them up. The women, the woman that was set to get stoned to death, remember that was against the wall, and they said, Jesus came and said, let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. That's found in John 8, 11. And then Deborah, that was a woman who prophesied, and I think it was, you know, I don't want to say the wrong name, but it was a, a man that was over an army, can't think of his name, but he was afraid to go to war. And Deborah said, because you're afraid, the Lord is going to deliver us by a woman's hand. And that happened because the man that they were fleeing, that they were going against, hid inside of a tent. And a woman, while he was asleep, put a stake in the side of his head to the ground. She won the battle for them, a woman. And they don't name her, so she doesn't have a name in the Bible. But I'm just showing you the significance and how God uses women. He used the woman, the Samaritan woman, she went out and told the whole town after Jesus told her about herself. That was a living, breathing testimony that went out and saved who knows how many people, right? Because some of them believed just from her coming, and then others had to go to Jesus and see for themselves. And he ended up staying with them three more days. Then there's Esther, one of my favorites, Queen Esther, who had she not been a fear, a God-fearing woman, and kept all that she learned about God in her heart, she could not have saved a nation, a people, if she had not been true to God. And so um, she was able to save and undergo or, you know, throw out what um, Haman was going to do, which Haman had a plot. So that's Esther 7. If you want to look up Esther. It's all the whole book of Esther, but I think Esther 7. And then Hagar. Hagar is um, the maid that had Ishmael. And that was that brings us to Sarah. Sarah and Abraham. Sarah was of old age. Abraham was of old age. And they came to him and said, you're going to have children. And your children are going to, you know, be it, it just so many that the nation is like the sand. That's how many descendants you're going to have. Yeah. Right, the start. Okay, and they were just like, no way, you know, 100 years old. There's nobody that's coming out of here. And she chuckled in the kitchen or wherever you want to say she is. In my mind, she's in the kitchen. And, you know, they heard her. And they called her on it. And she was like, no, I didn't, I didn't laugh. That wasn't me. <laughs> and they're like, yes, you did. And, and it came to pass, but... In that, what do we as women do sometimes? It's a tendency, I know I have, when God doesn't move quick enough, when God doesn't do what I think he said he told me he's going to do, I'll go ahead and fix that for you. I'm going to go ahead and get that car that I know I can't afford, but the Lord provided. So no, I don't have, you know, I don't know, infinity money. I got Toyota money, or I got, you know, Honda money, but I want a Honda. You know, there's a difference in the price, and we go ahead of God, and then, you know, we get ourselves in a mess. And that's what Sarah did. She went ahead of God and told her husband, go ahead and go with the, the maid and make this baby, because the Lord said we're going to have a baby, and maybe it's not through me. Go ahead and go with the maid, and they made 
named Ishmael. And Ishmael, to this day, <laughs> we got a mess going on with Ishmael's kids. <laughs> but amen, praise the Lord. God still provided, and Sarah did end up having a baby named Isaac. So it came to pass that I say that because as women, when we're married, sometimes we have a tendency to overrule our husbands. We'll tell them, this is what's the best thing to do. Do this. And our husbands, sometimes they listen to us. Okay, and they go do it, just like Abraham. He went and did what she told him to do. He didn't come to her and say, I would like to sleep with that man over there. She didn't look at all good. You know, he did not say that. He didn't say, I want to go, uh, you know, ahead of the Lord. And I, I think I heard him say, she's the one over here. He didn't, he didn't do that. It was his wife who said, this is what I think we should do. And I think you should do. Go, go, go make this happen. So she went ahead of God. And he just listened and did what his wife told him to do. So... I say that, that as a wife, a wife myself, and many of you have been married, you know that a woman has a persuasion all her own. A woman can get a man to do what even a man thinks he won't do. Look at Adam and, and uh, Eve in the garden. He knew way before she was even made not to eat of that tree. You know that? She knew nothing. She wasn't even existing. When God told him, you can have anything in the garden except this right here. And do you know by himself, he never touched that tree. But when Eve came, ah, oh, Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Eve will change, <laughs> change it up on you. We bat those eyes and we say that talk. And you, you know what you can get a guy to do. So we can be very persuasive. So just like... Uh, uh, we are able to do that just like Adam and Eve and Sarah was the same with uh, Abraham. And so I just bring these things to you to show you that as women we have significance. God does use us. He uses us in mighty ways and in our imperfections. He doesn't say wait until you get all good when you, when you stop smoking, when you stop drinking, when you stop doing that. See me. He doesn't say that. No. The woman at the well, she was with a guy who wasn't her husband at the time. And she had been with a few more. And God was like, she just told her, yeah, you're right. He, when he said, go get your husband, she said, I don't have a husband. You're right, you don't have a husband. And the one you're with now is not your husband, right? <laughs> Called her out on that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you know when your skeletons just come out like that, you go, oh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> nobody about the new one, you know, here on the low level. <laughs> so, but Jesus knows everything. And that's what you really need to know at all times. You're not fooling anybody, even when you think you're fooling yourself. You're not fooling God. He knows everything. And um, I just wanted to tell you that in our imperfection, when, when, we're, when we're sleeping around, when we're unfaithful, when we're, when we're terrible to ourselves, when we don't think we're worthy, mm -hmm. when we do things to ourselves, drugs, drinking, whatever, that's hurting ourselves, God still loves us in that point, in that present moment. He does not say, when you get better, when you get off drugs, when you stop drinking, that's when I'll love you, Maria. That's when I'll love you, Melanie. You no. Know, he says, right now. Come to me right now. And if you've already been saved and you're in those predicaments, he's never left. Sometimes we think he's left us, but God has never left us. The only person who leads in the relationship between us and Christ is us. We walk away. We don't want to be bothered or we want to do our own thing. We want to fix it. We want to get out there and fix it like Sarah. I got that, Lord. You don't need this one. I got this one. I got that. You know? And it's when we do that that we mess it up, right? Because who knows us better than we know ourselves? God, you don't even know how many hairs you have on your head, right? And so I, I come to you today, I wanted to share a couple things really quickly about something that I learned that I didn't know about Rahab. So I, I knew about the rope and the slide, and that was no big deal, right? Y'all know about the fight. But what I didn't know is who she became. Yeah. The
that Jesus stirred and who he made her to be. The prostitute, the person that was doing, and she probably was like, what was that mistress that everybody knew on TV? And she had harlots, and you know what I mean? I forgot the lady. She was totally famous on TV. I can't think of her name. Hit the news, and everybody knew about this, this uh, prostitute in America, uh, in Los Angeles. And she, she did to high people. I don't know her name, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So that's kind of how Rahab was. She was known. She was, she was, yeah, she was the one on the block. You want something done, you want a little something, something, you saw Rahab. So, so they knew her, and, and she was also of, like, countenance. You know, she was, she was beautiful, and she was business, right? She's taking care of business, getting it done, right? But the Lord, she still, even if she wasn't a Christian at that point, what Rahab did know and what she did believe is the fear of the Lord God. Even if it wasn't her God, she heard about this God, that God that parted the Red Sea, that God, that God that got rid of the Egyptians, the God who killed Pharaoh's son, that God, that God. Yeah, that's God for real, for real, for real. Like all these people were melting. Can you imagine melting with fear? Melting with fear. And they had arms. They had armies. They had like good gobs of men to just, they could have just, in, in our eyes, we would have said the battle was won for their side. But just from stories, just from hearing, just from, you ever had rumors or stories go out before somebody, you'd be like, yeah, I heard about you. That's what they did. They heard about the Israelites, and they were melting with fear. But back to Rahab. Rahab not only saved, the um, spies, what I learned in my studies is that she married one. That I did not know. His name was Salom, S-A-L-O-M, and he was one of the spies. He married her, and he made a woman of her. He was a prince, called him a prince of Solomon. Sol Sol Solomon was a prince of the house of Judah. And so in a way, she went from being a prostitute to a princess, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's what she did. Right. Right. And not only right. did she do that, but God started to change. Mm -hmm. She already feared the Lord God. She already confessed with her mouth. Mm -hmm. And she already even laid her life on the line mm -hmm. to save these. Because she could have died, by the way. If they would have found them, they would have heard them. If they would have detected them, her life first, mm -hmm. and then the spies, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. she betrayed them. So she put her life out there on the line. So that's, that was amazing to me that not only, so it's, it's, it's to show you that God can change your life in such a miraculous way. From the, from the streets to the palace. That's what God can do for us. That's the kind of change and the kind of king and the kind of God we serve. And not only did he do this, but in her and through her, she was part of the lineage and the uh, ancestry of Jesus. Yes, Jesus right. came down through her people. Rahab, the one with the velvet robe. I was <laughs> like, shut up, shut <laughs> up. That's some good stuff right there. I was so excited, like, woo. I mean, that's what you call a turnaround. I mean, you was down here, you up here, and up here. You know, I was like, I love it, I love it. And that is how God is. He is amazing. And he's a game changer. We don't change people. God changes people. And so that's why when you're in a relationship, or even if it's yourself, you only can change yourself. You need not be concerned about anyone else, boyfriend, husband, friend. You would just change them. If they would just listen to me, if I could just get them to, that's not your job. What you should do is pray to God. Bless them, be with them, but give me more patience. Help me to deal better with them. Help me to see them differently. Help me to respect our differences and so on and so forth, right? Pray for them, but you don't pray for change. You pray for God to bless and do with them what he wants, right? Because we can't change them. We all know that. Only God changes. And I thank God for that, because if you think about that, I wouldn't want anybody else to change me. I wouldn't want anybody else to change me. Not my husband, not my friends, 
have a plastic surgeon to look like whatever. Nobody. I don't trust anybody. But the creator, the, per, the, the God of the universe who made me in his image, okay, I'm going to go ahead and trust him to change me. I'm going to trust him. He made me out of the dirt. The dirt, y'all. He formed dirt and blew life in me. Who better to change me than the very person who made me himself? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm only here. I'm only a vessel. I'm only a pot for him. I'm only here. My only significance on earth is to pour out him. That's all I am. I'm a piece of dirt for, for life and the living water to flow through. Right? I have no significance. We're temples, and that's why we're supposed to honor our bodies, because they belong to him. They belong to him. So... Last, I just wanted to share with you, I did kind of share with you already about Sarah and the significance of a woman and how we can change um, men and how we can persuade them and how it is significant that God made men the head of the household for a reason. Sometimes we think we know like what they should be doing and they can't get that right. Why won't they just do it this way? But God made them different for a reason. You know, thank God we're not the same. What would that be like? A woman would that be like? You know, thank God he made Adam like he is an Eve. There's significant differences. And he wanted that so that they could fit between, right? If, if you were the same, you're not going to be fit, right? Just, uh, just bored. And, uh, I guess we're going skating. Yeah, we're going skating. You know, it just would be like hearing yourself twice all the time. And that, so it's good to have that, that difference. And God wants that difference to come together and to become one and then to think like him. Thinking like him because when you don't want to love him, guess what? Jesus still loves him. That's how you're supposed to be. I got to still love him. You know, when God went to the, when Jesus went to the cross, he still loved us. When we were yelling out profanities and, and cursing him, he still loved us. He went all the way. He never stopped. He never turned around and just shut down lightning and just wiped us out. Because he could have. He could have. You don't know who you're talking to. If anybody could have turned around and snapped his finger and said, you don't know who you're talking to right now, that would have been him, right? Could have wiped this earth clean, just like he did with Noah and the flood. Just like that. With, with just saying this thing. Calling the angels. So we, we serve a mighty God. And it's him that we have by example. His love and his constant sustaining us. Doesn't he constantly love us whether we do wrong, whether we do right, when we try, when we don't try, when he asks us to do something, when we're like, what was that? Were you talking to her? You know, that, <laughs> you know, he's like, no, I, if you heard it, I was talking to you, you know, right? But, but he still loves us. He still loves us. Amen. So I just wanted to share those things about women and that we have a significance. And I just wanted to challenge you. You don't have to be perfect just willing. What all the women that I shared about have in common is that they were willing. They were willing to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, Rahab was in a place, the right place at the right, but she was willing. Sarah was willing. You know, everybody was in a place. The, the Samaritan, she wasn't even a Jew, right? She was a Samaritan, but she believed she was willing. So God can change you, and I just wanted to challenge you um, and leave you with this last scripture, Isaiah 6, 8. Lord, here I am, send me. So it's not when you get better. It's not when you're, I mean, first we want to profess and become a Christian. So we do want that in our life. But <coughs> when we're messing up and when we still have a ride, even as Christians, and we still always have work to do, so none of us will be perfect, but that we know we're striving and that God can use us right where we are. Amen. Amen.